to say that Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 forced many NATO member states to re-evaluate the importance of military preparedness would, I think, be an understatement. The re-emergence of full-scale conventional peer-on-peer conflict in Europe provided an imperative for Russia, Ukraine, and indeed for NATO to rearm and to reinvigorate their defence industrial bases. But nearly 18 months on, if you ask how effective those rearmament efforts have been, you're going to read some wildly varying assessments. What's relatively easy, whether you're talking about Russian or NATO production, is to just come up with a convenient narrative. And for better or worse, there are certainly no shortage of those. Talking about Russia, for example, you'll see claims that their defence sector has roared into action and will, somehow, produce 1,500 T-90M tanks this year. Flip to the other extreme and you'll find claims that Russian industry is basically falling apart and they can't build so much as a paper aeroplane without an imported American circuit board and a manufacturing floor full of German machine tooling. Switch the focus to the West and you'll find much the same variance, with narratives ranging from Western defence industry roaring back like it's 1944, to NATO industry being basically incapable of doing anything, even if that thing is just keeping up with Russia. As I've said before though, creating a narrative is easy, finding evidence can be harder. But one of the best ways to try and find evidence relating to defence industrial production and rearmament is, as in many other things, to follow the money. Because if a defence industry somewhere is churning out product, someone somewhere is almost certainly paying for it. And so today I want to start doing exactly that. Thankfully, we've started getting data now that helps answer that question. July saw what I'm sure you will all agree was 2023's most anticipated release. Bigger than Barbie, Oppenheimer, Baldur's Gate 3 or Starfield, the new NATO defence expenditure estimates for 2023 dropped in July. And if you do happen to be one of those people who can derive joy from spreadsheets, I'll leave a link to it in the description. It's those estimates, with the emphasis there on estimates, that I'll be relying on through most of the rest of this video. Using that data, I want to zoom out and get a big picture around NATO's ongoing rearmament efforts, getting a sense for how quickly words and orders are being converted into deliveries, and to set a base of comparison when we look at Russian efforts in the future, to assess how well both sides are placed to win a long-term war of capability, production, and attrition. I'll cover a few caveats around this data and its interpretation, and then look at NATO spending patterns before 2022, during 2022, and now according to the most recently released data in 2023. I'll talk through which countries are clearly moving quickly and dramatically, which ones aren't, talk through some of the relevant major programs and other sources of funding that are relevant to rearmament efforts, and then close out by trying to put some perspective around NATO's overall response in terms of defence spending. So before we start charging through NATO expenditure data, let me just throw up a few warnings about the ways in which this might be deceptive or all the ways in which you can get it wrong. For one, just getting an apples-to-apples -apples comparison between countries or across years can be pretty difficult. The most common mechanism for this is just taking whatever the official budget is, converting it into US dollars at market exchange rates, and there you go. Most people, after all, have at least some vague idea of what one US dollar is worth. Unfortunately, it's really not that easy and there's a lot of reasons to be careful. For example, we've talked about purchasing power parity before, so I won't re-explore the issue here. But if you want an intuitive understanding of the concept, just compare the rents somewhere like Shanghai or Manhattan to anywhere actually on the planet Earth and you'll see the concept in action. But even just the basic act of doing the conversion from national currency into US dollars can give you findings that might be a little bit deceptive. That's because foreign exchange rates can vary over time and indeed can vary a lot over time. As someone who is currently spending Australian dollars in Europe watching the exchange rate currently decline, trust me, I know. What a dollar redo buys one week may not be the same as what it buys a week later. And what that can mean is that a national defence budget can look like it's going up or down, despite the fact the spending in national currency is remaining static. If you denominated your defence budget in Russian rubles, for example, and at the time your budget was set, you were getting roughly 60 rubles to the dollar, but a year later that rate had somewhat change to about 100 to the dollar, then unless you add a lot of additional spending in ruble terms, it's going to look like your spending is falling by 30 or 40 percent. In practical terms, that may or may not actually matter. If all of your expenditures are in rubles, all of the prices are agreed in rubles, and everything is being purchased from the domestic economy, then you may not actually feel it that much in terms of defence output. On the flip side, if your defence spending includes a lot of imported components or goods, well then, I hope you're ready for some hard decisions. 
because arms exporters tend to be fans of hard currency, and most probably won't do you any favours just because the forex line goes down. Even if most of your spending is domestic, well, inflation is there to ruin your fun anyway. Over the last couple of years, we've all become beautifully acquainted with this phenomenon that destroys the value of money over time. This is the phenomenon that basically explains why an amount of money that used to buy you a bag full of groceries somewhere like the United Kingdom will probably now just buy you the bag and a few miscellaneous items and broken hopes and dreams to go inside it. The same phenomenon is a significant threat in the defence sector. And where you have inflation running at a very high place, places like Turkey for example, if the budget doesn't keep up with increasing wages and the cost of critical inputs, then you're going to lose real output. And if soldiers' salaries don't keep pace with inflation, well, then from a historical perspective, let's just say that's not um, positively correlated with political stability. Pay protests can get pretty hectic when the strikers have access to main battle tanks. And yet, tracking spending is still probably one of the best tools we have if we want to track output and activity. With the basic reason being, if something is being done or something is being built, then someone is probably paying for it. Announcements and claims are free, weapon systems are not. And while it's possible to have spending without output, for example, if 80% of the budget is being spent on mansions, yachts, or corporate retreats, as opposed to new weapon systems, unless you're talking about very niche cases, you probably can't have output without spending. And so despite all the limitations, if we want to track how quickly NATO or Russia is rearming, following the money is a good place to start. Which brings us to NATO spending patterns before February 2022. Because if you want to assess how much things have changed since then, you need a baseline. Which for us today is going to be 2014 through 2021. We've talked before about the post-Cold War peace dividend. That phenomenon whereby a bunch of NATO countries saw the Soviet Union go away in 1991. And subsequently, and in many cases you'd argue quite fairly, decided that schools and hospitals were in and defence spending was out. And even in the early 2010s, the phenomenon was still very much alive in a lot of NATO countries. I've joked before that the fastest way the Russians could demilitarise NATO would be to sit around and do nothing for 20 years. But even though that's a joke, there might be some truth to it. The Russian occupation of Crimea in 2008 had provided some stimulus to European defence activity. But in 2014 and 15, NATO spending was actually declining in real terms. In 2014, real spending fell by 4%, mostly thanks to American spending declining by 5%. In 2015, NATO spending fell by another 1.6%, again mostly driven by a 2.8% real decline in US spending. There was a brief uptick in 2016, before overall spending fell again in 2017. 2017 was actually an interesting year because the non-US NATO allies collectively raised spending by about 6% in real terms that year. But the American cuts that year were so deep that they more than made up for them. Because America spends a lot of money on defence. And so when Uncle Sam is moving in one direction, it takes an awful lot of effort in Canada and Europe to win that particular tug of war. As you can see from this chart here, spending did start to tick up again in 2019, led by the US, and continued slow growth through 2020, this time largely led by the European allies. But with operations in Afghanistan coming to an end, even though tensions in Ukraine were growing, 2021 again saw a subtle downtick. Beyond how much was being spent, what it was being spent on is probably also useful information. And in particular, how much was being spent on new munitions and equipment. Because if you're spending 100% of your budget on just keeping the proverbial lights on, you're not really rearming. It's kind of like if you're running a business and your rent goes up, it'd be kind of odd to claim that increase in expenditure meant that your business had grown. So if you're analysing a budget, whether it's going up or down, it helps to see where that increase or decrease is coming from. And in many NATO militaries, it looks like for a long time, the cuts were being made to new equipment purchases. A decision that couldn't possibly end badly and never ever leads to the death spiral, wherein buying less stuff leads to less scale, which makes the stuff more expensive, which leads to buying less stuff. In 2014, about 23.4% of NATO defence budgets was being spent on new equipment. And then by 2016, it fell to 23% flat, presumably because decimals just annoy some people. There was, it must be said, a lot of variance between the various NATO powers. The US was spending around 25% of its budget on new equipment. The Turks, British and French in 2014 were all north of 
while Germany was at a comparatively leisurely 12%, Spain at 6.7%, while Belgium in 2016 was south of 5%, a significant uptick from their 2014 figure of 35 meaning that in 2014, for every euro the Belgian military spent on new equipment, it spent 22 on salaries. By 2021, however, the alliance average ticked up to 27%. It wasn't exactly frenetic rearmament, but it does mean that when we look at the 2022 figures, we should be aware that spending was already on a shallow upward trend before the Russian tanks rolled in February 2022. And there's no denying the fact that that invasion was a dramatic moment. For the people of Ukraine, it changed their lives forever. While for the NATO allies, particularly those in Europe, it was a dramatic strategic wake-up call. Proof not just that the assumptions that had underpinned the old peace dividend were perhaps not entirely applicable in the 2020s, but that large-scale, mechanised conventional warfare in Europe was now once again a reality, and that the alliance would have to respond accordingly. In some respects, the NATO governments appeared to charge into action. By June 2022, NATO had a new strategic concept, one that now expressly recognised the military threat that Russia posed, and one which now put a lot more emphasis on conventional military deterrence on Europe's eastern flank. The strategy of trying to deter Russia from starting a major war by buying a lot of their stuff was out, and the somewhat more timeless strategy of deterrence achieved by pointing lots of guns at the border was back in. We also saw governments make a flurry of announcements relating to defence and defence preparedness. Perhaps the most famous of these was the so-called Zeitenwender speech by Olaf Scholz, which would be followed by an announcement that Germany was establishing a 100 billion euro special fund to support the modernisation and rebuilding of the Bundeswehr. Other leaders spoke about the need for enhanced military preparedness or talked about buying new equipment. Emmanuel Macron said that the French industry needed to move over to a wartime footing. And we saw announcements relating to three main initiative tracks. Firstly, immediate security support to Ukraine. Secondly, the rebuilding of domestic militaries. And thirdly, the support for the domestic defence industrial bases across these various states. Given that the events of February 2022 seem to have galvanised public support behind increased defence spending in many of these countries, you could argue there was every incentive for these governments to look strong and decisive on matters of national defence. And I mean... What better way is there to look decisive than to make a couple of announcements? But ground announcements don't necessarily translate to money going out the door and things being produced. And in a lot of NATO states, there are a variety of factors that spoke against a rapid ramp-up, no matter what the political and social sentiment of the time might be. To name just a few of these factors, many nations had already agreed their defence budgets for most or all of 2022 before the invasion took place. Others initially expected a short war and didn't feel any particular rush to revise those estimates. In other cases, defence departments found themselves in the position of being told that it was time to rearm, but not initially being sure exactly what they wanted to spend money on. In early 2022, the war in Ukraine was highly dynamic, lessons were being observed and learned in real time. And you can probably imagine some defence leaders being a little bit nervous about committing to a multi-year order of superweapon number three, just in case the next two weeks of fighting in Ukraine proved that it was vulnerable to drone-dropped munitions or something. No one wanted to be the guy who went all in on horse cavalry in 1938. And then finally, there was just the limitations of bureaucracy. How quickly could procurement functions actually move? How rapidly could they draft and develop requirements, hold competitions, award contracts, and get money spent? In some countries, that wasn't a titanic barrier. In others, it was Germany. And so, in response to the greatest conventional military challenge on the European continent since the Second World War, the non-US NATO allies increased real defence spending in 2022 by about 2%. Not 2 percentage points of GDP, 2%. Meanwhile, Uncle Sam, looking at this situation but also increasingly challenged by China in the Asia-Pacific, took a slightly different track and increased spending by 1.3%. There is a key point to be made here, of course, that in most cases, these figures do not include aid to Ukraine. As we've talked about before, that ramped up relatively quickly. But in terms of ramping up domestic spending on domestic readiness, 2022 saw less of an increase than 2019 had. Of course, that doesn't mean the picture was by any stretch uniform. Some countries were already seeing significant increases. Finland and the Netherlands both increased spendings in real terms by more than 20%. 
And Lithuania, which I think we can all agree might have had some reasons to remain on edge, increased spending by more than 25%. At the other end of the spectrum, US spending in real terms moved very little. Defence spending in the United Kingdom actually decreased in real terms, with UK defence spending in US dollar terms falling by about 30 bucks per capita between 2021 and 2022. Meanwhile, the Turkish government was in the early stages of watching domestic inflation eat the defence budget in slow motion, as increasing the defence budget by about 75% in lira terms, adding more than 80 million lira to the overall pile, became an approximately 10% reduction in constant US dollar terms. Because as far as economic phenomena go, inflation isn't a particularly picky offender, and will very happily come for the sticker price of a tank or a jet, as much as for the price of a pint at the local pub. But maybe you might be thinking there was a different pattern in the overall equipment spend. After all, we've previously talked about how vital this category is in the context of the war in Ukraine. New equipment doesn't just generate new capability, it also frees up old equipment to be potentially sent to assist Kyiv. Because as much as, in some cases, the Ukrainians have been happy to receive equipment that's been in mothballs for as much as half a century, freeing up materiel from at very least the post-disco era, and if you want to get really generous stuff from the age of dial-up internet, would be very helpful to the Ukrainian military while they try and manage the small strategic task of holding off the entire bloody Russian army. And that's where new equipment spending comes in. Plus, it's equipment spending that has some of the most significant industrial implications. For-profit defence firms are generally not going to build up factories and productive capacity if you're not going to buy the products that those factories produce. Essentially, it's very hard to have a rearmament process without spending on armaments. And with the sudden shift in NATO's strategic environment brought on by the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine as reflected in NATO's new strategic concept, we heard an awful lot about the need to reinvigorate the Western defence industrial base. So, with all that said, what do you think happened in 2022 according to these NATO estimates? Despite the relatively small overall increases, were there perhaps outsized increases in spending on new armaments to reinvigorate factories and prepare for the coming strategic challenges? Uh, yeah, no, spending on new equipment actually fell in US dollar terms between 2021 and 2022. As you might expect here from the chart, the big driver was the United States because this is a game of big numbers and the US has some very big numbers. And in short, while the US defence budget did increase in real terms from 2021 to 2022 according to these reported figures, the percentage actually spent on new equipment fell by more. Meaning that if you look just at these reported estimates for 2022, which means that the overall response of NATO states to what was arguably the greatest security challenge on the European continent in recent memory, was in the end, to spend slightly less on new weapons and supporting equipment for their militaries than they had the year before. That doesn't mean that significant funds weren't being budgeted separately to assist Ukraine, or that major orders weren't being planned and prepared for future years, but in 2022, the deliveries largely weren't there. And indeed, without additional supplemental funding intended to assist Ukraine, there are a number of NATO militaries that might be staring down the barrel of harder decisions. A lot has been written, for example, about the hard choices the US Army was likely to face in the coming years. Given the costs involved in, for example, trying to adopt new families of armoured vehicles or acquire a range of long-range fire options. Fortunately for US Army, some of the funding intended to replace equipment sent to Ukraine can help solve some of those dilemmas. By essentially helping convert older vehicles like M113s or Bradleys from Desert Storm into things like newly built AMPVs. I don't know where else in the world you can trade in a 30 or 40 year old vehicle and get a brand new one at someone else's expense, but if anyone out there knows, uh, please do tip me off. I should also note that, of course, there were exceptions to the overall pattern. Poland, for example, for obviously unknowable reasons, appears to have decided that it didn't just want to rearm, it wanted to do so quickly. And so the Poles found a defence partner in the form of the Republic of Korea that was really willing to pick up the pace with the Koreans managing to deliver the first new K2 main battle tanks and K9 howitzers before the end of 2022. In defence industry terms, that isn't just express postage. It's the ultra-premium delivery option where the courier is pulling into the driveway a picosecond after you hit the order confirm button. But overall, NATO defence budgets in 2022 were relatively slow to grow, especially when compared to the pace at which expenditure in Russia was suddenly growing. Russia and Ukraine may have nowhere near the same financial resources that NATO does. 
But as we'll talk about in the future, they took a different approach to applying those that they did have in 2022. But what about 2023? After all, 2023 was going to be the year when most NATO nations would be operating for the first time off post-full-scale invasion defence budgets. And so spending in 2023 would probably better reflect NATO countries' views on the security environment post-February 2022 than had the spending rates of 2022 itself. As far back as March 2022, I'd highlighted the fact that NATO had superior financial resources to Russia. What was unknown was the extent to which the political will was in place to actually leverage those resources. I don't believe in burying the lead, so the headline figures are as follows. Overall NATO expenditure in US dollar terms increased by about $90 billion between 2022 and 2023. Spending by the non-US component of NATO jumped from 1.65% of GDP in 2022 to 1.74% in 2023. An increase, but still overall short of the alliance's 2% target. On one hand, hardly an all-out mobilisation, but on the other hand, still enough to generate an increase larger than the entire pre-full-scale invasion Russian defence budget. And again, the devil is in the detail, with different alliance members responding to very different degrees. In Finland and Poland, I'm convinced that the response to a territorially expansionist Russia is basically genetically ingrained reflex at this point. And so presumably someone locked up the treasury officials and turned on the money taps. In real terms, Finland increased defence spending in 2023 by more than 45%. Meanwhile in Poland, Warsaw's level of chill with the entire situation was reflected in a defence budget increase of more than 60%. To put that in perspective, if the US were to suddenly increase its defence budget by 60%, the resulting sum would buy very approximately 6,000 additional F-35s per year. Assuming a price of 85 million per, and that being the only spending priority for the additional sum. The human brain doesn't tend to do well with large percentage increases, so I thought I'd give you that perspective. Then there are a number of countries occupying that 10 to 30% increase range. Norway, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Canada, Bulgaria, Spain, you can see the full list on screen there. The US increase in these estimates was a bit shy of 3%. While a select few NATO members decided to respond to the new security environment with defence sector cuts, at least in real terms. The UK was very generous and continues to be very generous in its aid towards Ukraine, but its own forces are expected to see a small decrease in funding in real terms. Belgium's aid to Ukraine was not as generous, but their military saw a reduction in funding regardless, as did that of Italy. And in 2023, these figures suggest that Belgium's defence expenditure will equal 1.13% of GDP, a fall from 1.19% in 2022. To be clear, each of these lines has their own unique political and economic context and story behind it. Adding in Ukraine-related aid, for example, would make this chart look somewhat different, particularly when talking about big donors like the UK, Germany or the Netherlands. But the headline reported figures are the headline reported figures, and there they are. The members of the NATO alliance may be united on a great many things, but not, it seems, on the direction of their near-term defence budgets. Now, before we jump into the detail, I thought it might be worth stopping for a moment to give some perspective. This episode isn't meant to cover Russian defence spending or defence mobilisation efforts. We'll talk about those in the future. Over the first six months of 2023, the total Russian state budget across all areas was reportedly about 15 trillion rubles. At January 1st exchange rates, that would have been about 205 billion US dollars, and at current market exchange rates, closer to 160. Of that, Reuters reported that about 5.6 trillion was spent on defence, considerably higher than official estimates. That would equate to about 60 billion US dollars for the first six months of the year, and a total annual target of about 120 billion, assuming spending patterns hold and the ruble stays static against the US dollar. Both those assumptions, to be very clear, are pretty shit ones, but we're going to use them for the moment. But using those assumptions, the figures we arrive at suggest that NATO's increase in spending in market exchange rate terms for 2023, leaving purchasing power parity and other factors aside, is about three quarters the size of the wartime Russian defence budget. So while we're talking about a relatively small change in percentage terms within NATO, it's still an awful lot of cash that is being moved around. Though I imagine for Ukraine and some others, there must be considerable frustration that it wouldn't take that much more of an effort in percentage terms to move this situation from relative equilibrium to a situation where the Russians are being decisively outscaled in the spending game. 
Perspective given, let's jump straight back into the detail. In particular, what percentage of the budgets are being spent on equipment? Because you can bet that in 2023 and 2024, Ukraine is going to be carefully watching for every instance of a NATO country, for example, retiring an F-16 because a new platform has arrived, or in the case of Poland, newly arriving K-2s and M1 Abrams freeing up PT-91s for potential shipment to Ukraine. And in 2023, unlike in 2022, we finally started to see an increase in money going out the door, something which is usually pretty closely associated with equipment being ordered or delivered. As the chart on screen shows, in 2022, according to these estimates, NATO countries spent about 310 billion US dollars on new equipment. In 2023, that figure is estimated to be closer to 370 billion, a roughly 60 billion US dollar increase that I'm sure every potential US or NATO rival will no doubt be sending flower baskets to Moscow for causing. And despite making up a minority of overall alliance spending, it's the non-US countries that actually account for a majority of this estimated increase. Of course, of the very roughly $57 billion in additional equipment spending, the US is the largest contributor, with an estimated increase of about $28.2 billion, much of which, you have to suspect, will actually be directed towards increasing preparedness for Asia-Pacific scenarios rather than for European ones. Then, despite having a national GDP somewhere between that of Massachusetts and Virginia, the second bar on that chart is actually Poland. The lion's share of Poland's massive increase in its defence budget is being directed into buying more things that explode or assist them in delivering things that explode to things that need exploding, with the increase in 2023 being to the tune of $9.3 billion US dollars equivalent. That's a bit more than the next two totals combined, roughly $5.1 billion from Germany and $4.1 billion from Canada. The next largest elements of the overall increase are Finland and Romania, followed up by literally every other member of NATO combined, who together have increased their total equipment spending by about 6.6 billion US dollars. Given that the everyone else column includes such major European defence spenders as Italy, France, the United Kingdom, I think it makes for a pretty interesting picture, only made possible by some pretty significant changes in spending ratios. Finland, for example, has gone from spending about 20% of its total defence budget in 2021 on new equipment to spending 50% of its planned 2023 budget on the same. So let's dig a little deeper for a minute and have a look at some of those countries individually, asking both what they're spending and also how they're spending it. US spending is the hardest to profile quickly for two reasons. The first is simply because the US operates in so many different theatres of strategic interest. Whereas when Finland or Poland invests in some sort of military capability, you probably don't need three guesses as to where it's directed. American investments may be targeting everywhere from Europe to the Asia-Pacific. The second factor is just the sheer scale. The US defence budget is less a case of monetary flows as it is of monetary tsunamis. A similar difficulty pervades any attempt to properly analyse Chinese defence spending. Although in the PRC case, at least some of those monetary flows are piped underground and questionably labelled. What is clear is that in the US case, many of the Ukraine-specific requirements are being funded through their own supplementals. Meanwhile, the defence budget proper focuses on the uplift of the force as a whole, including the demands of the Asia-Pacific. 2023 reported spending is estimated to be up by about 2.8% in real terms on 2022 levels, taking US defence expenditure to 3.5% of GDP, which is high by NATO standards, but a reduction from the 3.7%, for example, of 2014. Because as expensive as deterrence in the Asia-Pacific and responding to Russian action in Europe is... Afghanistan and Iraq weren't exactly cheap affairs. I will say the US budget, like many of these, probably doesn't capture the full range of responses to the war in Ukraine. The US, for example, makes very heavy use of Ukraine-specific supplemental funding, and we've also seen movement to put in place multi-year orders for things like munitions. Those are preparations that are being put in place now, but we're only going to really see the full impact on the budget in coming years. By historical standards, the US path towards rearmament is taking a pretty slow burn approach. As for Poland, by contrast, they pretty much put the accelerator all the way down last year and then welded it in place. If you want to increase the amount that you're spending on new equipment, there are a couple of different levers you can pull. You could just increase the share of your economy you're dedicating towards defence, you could increase the size of the overall economy, or you could take your defence budget and spend a greater percentage of it on new kit instead of other things. 
Poland, looking at this list of options, decided to do all three at the same time. In 2014, Poland was spending 1.9% of its GDP on defence, below the NATO target. In 2023, that figure is estimated to be 3.9%, higher than that of the United States, a country which, as we just discussed, has a need to project power all around the world. And that increase in spending ratio doesn't quite capture the scale of the increase because the Polish economy has also grown considerably since 2014, meaning that what looks like a roughly two times increase is in fact closer to a three times increase. And then out of that defence budget that is roughly three times what it was less than a decade ago, the percentage spent on new equipment has increased from 19% in 2014 to 52% in 2023. Put that all together and you have a Polish equipment budget in 2023, about eight times that of 2014, and more than twice the six billion US dollars equivalent that was spent in 2022. And the 2023 budget almost certainly isn't the end of it, because the Poles have been announcing particularly force transforming purchases pretty constantly. Back when I did a video on Poland in 2022, I'd already covered some of these. The purchase of artillery, multiple launch rocket systems, howitzers, and aircraft from the South Koreans for one. But since then, it's just kind of kept going. So many infantry fighting vehicles and armoured vehicles were added that I have to imagine they're one step short of providing every Polish household with one for use in case of emergency. And just in the last month, that time of recording, we've seen announcements including several hundred domestically produced anti-tank guided missiles, 400 light reconnaissance vehicles, again to a South Korean design which will be manufactured in Poland, and then just when you think they might be about to ease up for a moment, we got the announcement that Poland intends to acquire several hundred examples of the so-called CBWP infantry fighting vehicle. This again is reportedly going to be a hybrid design with both Polish and Korean DNA. The chassis will have South Korean DNA, very closely related to that of the K9 howitzer, while the turret may potentially be a domestic Polish design. The acquisition of this vehicle would add to the light heavy dynamic that Poland has going between their M1 tanks and their K2s. And with the first of these vehicles not reportedly due to be delivered until 2025, you shouldn't expect to see most of the budgetary impact of this announcement for some years. But unless we start to see some of these programs subjected to delays or cancellation in a big way, it does seem like the Polish military of 2028 or 2030 is going to look very, very different to the way it looks today. The German realm, by contrast, is taking something of a slow and steady approach. The bedrock of modernization efforts for the Bundeswehr are going to be that 100 billion euro special fund which, of course, in the end, won't actually end up being 100 billion euros of military spending. It will be worn away by factors like taxes, interest, and inflation, but in the end, it is still a very, very significant amount of money. That sum could, for example, fund all US defence and security assistance to Ukraine for quite a few years, or allow Germany to quite easily keep up with Polish defence purchases, assuming they contracted on anywhere close to the same prices and terms. And yet, we're not seeing most of that fund go out the door yet. There's a variety of reasons behind that, of course. For one thing, Germany's allocating a lot of that funding to purchase long lead time equipment. The Luftwaffe's new F-35s, for example, are probably the most famous purchase on the list. They'll obviously be a massive upgrade in Germany's air combat capabilities, and they will be Germany's new nuclear delivery system. But the first eight aren't expected to arrive until 2026. And as those who have worked in industry know, while the supplier would probably prefer you to pay as soon as you have a vague idea of buying a particular piece of equipment, buyers are usually pretty keen to get their hands on the product before they part with most of the cash. And a lot of Germany's other uplift plans follow similar patterns, either contracts for long lead time items, or decisions that are still working their way through the political and bureaucratic processes. That bureaucratic element remains a major barrier to German defence modernisation. The German defence minister has spoken extensively about the need to speed up procurements for the Bundeswehr. And in April, there was reporting of an internal defence ministry document that stressed that the time factor should have priority in all pending and future defence procurements. But we're talking about cutting red tape and increasing risk tolerance in Germany. So ultimately, time will tell. Finally, I imagine for many of you, Canada would be a surprise inclusion on that equipment spending chart. 
I haven't done a specific nation study on Canada yet, but suffice to say, the nation's military doesn't usually get massive international praise for its defence procurement. So, seeing equipment spending jump by something like $4 billion US dollars between 2022 and 2023 might take some people by surprise. Look at it a little closer, however, and you'll realise Canada isn't really embarking on a massive rearmament campaign, and the US probably doesn't have to start digging trenches and laying mines around the White House just yet. Now, it does appear in the 2023 estimates that Canada has been able to more than double the percentage of its defence budget that it spends on the equipment category. The caveat to that is that they only increased it to about 24%, which, as you might recall, is still short of the overall NATO average. The reason that appears as a massive increase is that over the last decade, that figure has ranged between roughly 10 and 15%. Arguably, this is an application of the maxim that if you want to show a massive improvement in anything, whether it's sport or business, just make sure you sandbag the baseline. On second thought, please don't do that, it's unethical, but hopefully you get what I'm saying. Despite this change, we should probably expect to see more pressure from NATO allies on Canada to further increase and reorient its defence spending. With every year that passes, there's more and more focus on the Arctic as a potential zone of great power competition. And if you're talking about NATO countries that have massive strategic interests in the Arctic and will be key to projecting power there, you're probably not going to be calling the Poles or the Italians. Instead, it's going to be countries like the Alliance's Scandinavian wing or Canada that are going to have the focus put on them when it comes to alliance planning in that region. But the detail of that is a discussion for another time. For now, it's enough to say that the reported pace of Canadian procurements is increasing. But by wider alliance standards, there's still a long way to go. So that's an overall picture of NATO defence expenditures in 2022 and 2023, and a detailed look at some of the major contributors to the change. Having gone through all that, you might now ask the question, do we have anything close to the full picture? Can we pass any sort of final judgement on how NATO militaries and the defence industrial base are responding to the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine? And the answer, unfortunately, is probably no. As tempting as it is to just take a chart of every nation's official defence expenditure from somewhere like Wikipedia and put it into a nice graphic, and then use that to conclude that in strategic terms the USA has nothing to worry about, that doesn't really work. Not just because budgets, for all the reasons we've discussed, tend to compare pretty badly country to country, but also because when we're talking about major events like Ukraine, there tend to be a lot more to the spending story than just headline defence budgets. So while we're talking about NATO responses to Ukraine, let's talk about just a few of them. The first are budgetary initiatives that are aimed at shoring up the defence industrial base and the supporting supply chains as opposed to just buying new equipment. This might take the form, for example, of funding a percentage of a new defence plant or providing incentives to any firm that is willing to come to your country and establish or expand its production of some critical good or service. The war in Ukraine is reteaching the lessons around how quickly defence materiel can be consumed in a peer-to-peer conflict. And so a lot of countries have become increasingly aware not just of how many systems they have on hand, but what the capacity of their industry is to produce those systems if required. The example that I always give is artillery shell production. But the challenges of these kind of industrial bottlenecks covers just about everything, from stinger missiles to counter-battery and air defence radars to cannon barrels and PGMs. What makes some of these investments hard to isolate in a defence context is that many don't relate to purely military goods. Instead, they cover dual-use components or critical resources. The US and EU are sinking tens of billions of dollars in euros respectively into scaling up their own domestic semiconductor industries, for example. Many countries are trying to fortify their supply chains for things like rare earth metals and critical resource inputs. And while a lot of this has utility for the defence industrial base, a lot of it has less to do with Ukraine and more to do with the experiences of the COVID pandemic and the associated supply chain disruptions. So across NATO countries as a whole, you could argue that one of the most expensive and high investment areas of the broader rearmament effort hasn't been in investing directly in military so much as in rebuilding the robustness, self-reliance and scale of the industry that supports it. It's an area of investment that, especially if it continues, will have strategic significance well beyond the scope of the current war. Then there is supplemental funding explicitly voted for Ukraine in various NATO states that we've talked about a bit before. In some cases, even though NATO members have had relatively small increases in their own domestic defence budgets, 
Their governments have separately budgeted significant security assistance for Ukraine. Now, you might be tempted to respond that that funding is obviously irrelevant to NATO rearmament because it's there to help Ukraine. And sure, it might be true that Ukraine is the intended beneficial recipient of this funding. But there are a whole range of ways in which Ukraine-related funding can find itself playing a key role in domestic rearmament. The US model, for example, has been well discussed. Munitions or equipment that are usually older and largely surplus to current US war planning requirements will be sent to Ukraine. But the supplemental funding passed by Congress doesn't say, send a thousand M113s and a bunch of Humvees and MRAPs to Ukraine. It specifies dollar figures. And those dollar figures are used to do things like allow Ukraine to make purchases directly from the US defense sector, or to fund new modern replacement equipment and munitions for the US military to replace that which was sent. As of March 2023, for example, the US Army had already received $8 billion US dollars worth of additional procurement funding through Ukraine supplementals, and a casual $6.7 billion US dollars in additional operation and maintenance funding. Which is, it must be said, probably a pretty good deal when you get a lot of it in exchange for trading away stuff you probably didn't need anyway. Indeed, in some cases, if you consider the age of the sent equipment versus the replacements, it'd be kind of like the Russians sending an ally 100 T-34s and buying 100 T-72s to replace them and then saying that it all came out evenly in the end because all that really happened is they lost 100 tanks and then gained 100 back. Another way this sort of funding is flowing through to the wider rearmament effort is through purchases directly from the defense industry. Some examples here might be USAI funding to Ukraine, where Ukraine is given funding to purchase things directly from US defense industry, or cases where countries like Germany or the Netherlands are stepping in to fund purchases for Ukraine from elsewhere in the European defense industry. The defense sector in the Czech Republic, for example, has seen a massive increase in revenues. Companies like Excalibur Army, for example, have been modernizing T-72s to send to Ukraine. The contracts for those efforts encourage Czech firms to invest in expanding their infrastructure, hiring additional personnel, and increasing their overall capacity. From a rearmament perspective within NATO and the Czech Republic specifically, that's fantastic. It's additional productive capacity and more trained personnel available to do critical work. But it's not work that's being funded by the Czech defense budget, and it's not going to show up in those NATO estimates we discussed earlier. Instead, a lot of that T-72 modernization work is being funded by the US and the Netherlands, in the form, you guessed it, of security assistance to Ukraine. It's not just Czech T-72s funded by the Netherlands and the USA. It's Slovenian self-propelled guns funded by Germany, Denmark, and Norway. It's ammunition from Warsaw Pact era ammunition factories funded by the United Kingdom and significant supplies of modern NATO standard ammunition underwritten by EU-wide efforts. In an awful lot of these cases, the weapon system or munition might end up in Ukraine, but the defense industrial and rearmament benefits are being realized within NATO. And the capacity being created to supply Ukraine may be there in future to create scale and bring down costs if European countries want to leverage it for their own efforts later on. Finally, there's repair and sustainment assistance for Ukraine as well. All of the kit being provided to Ukraine needs to be fixed and maintained somewhere. A lot of that work can be done in Ukraine, to be sure, but given, among other things, the threat of air and missile attack within Ukraine itself, a lot of the more significant repair and sustainment work on, for example, Western howitzers, main battle tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, and almost certainly eventually F-16 fighters, is being done in what are often new or expanded facilities in NATO countries. There are, for example, PZH repairs being done in Lithuania. Soviet-era equipment has been repaired in places like the Czech Republic, Bulgaria, or Poland. And again, these facilities and their expanded workforces are in many cases directly useful or relevant to NATO rearmament efforts, even if their only focus at the moment is to help support Ukraine. Just because the Russian invasion eventually ends doesn't mean that any of these people are going to forget suddenly how to do their jobs or that any of the accumulated capital machinery will spontaneously catch fire. Industrial smoking accidents are more of a wartime Russian phenomenon. So zooming out, where does that leave NATO rearmament efforts overall? Is it gearing up to meet the challenges that it identified in its strategic concept? Or is the effort so far falling far short of the rhetoric? The first answer to give is that there isn't really one NATO effort, there are many and each member nation is ultimately charting its own path. These vary wildly in scale, intent, and intensity. 
from Poland's full afterburner sprint towards military modernization to those where it seems like inflation and austerity is still winning out over any sort of strategic imperative. But if you want to assess the pattern as a whole, then I think it really becomes a matter of perspective. For example, there's a school of thought that suggests that NATO is still very much asleep at the wheel. That almost 18 months into a conflict, the alliance is still very much on peacetime expenditure settings. And the fact that estimated equipment expenditure actually went backwards in 2022 probably would have made for a fantastic clickbait YouTube short. In terms of expenditure as a percentage of GDP, at a time where defence is reportedly now accounting for as much as a third of the overall Russian state budget, NATO defence expenditure is not just short of where it was during major historical military crises like the Korean or Vietnam War, but also significantly less than it was during periods of peacetime military build-up, like the Reagan build-up of the 1980s. You'll hear arguments that that means NATO countries still have a lot of financial firepower left in the tank. But likewise, you'll see arguments that this reinforces the Russian belief that NATO countries are as a whole decadent and aren't willing to make the sacrifices necessary to win a game of great power competition and confrontation. Of course, the flip side characterization is that mountains are moving. The NATO economies are just so massive that even a relatively small increase in percentage terms is enough to generate an increase that is by itself greater in volume than Russia's official 2022 defence budget. Plus, it can be pointed out that 2023 was the first year that reflected new budgeting, and that all the planning that was done or orders that were placed in 2022 or 2023 will show up in these budget figures eventually, it's just not their time yet. Industrial supply chains can take years to spin up to speed, and so it may become more and more practical for deliveries of new equipment to accelerate in coming years. The other note fitting within this perspective is that the defence budgets are not the be-all and end-all of NATO's response to the war in Ukraine. Whereas for Russia, its own defence budget is the critical measure, for Ukraine and NATO, it will always be important to evaluate specific aid to Ukraine and industrial initiatives, as well as just defence spending. An attempt to balance those two extremes might be to say that NATO countries as a whole have broadly been pretty slow to ramp up domestic defence spending in response to the invasion of Ukraine. But nonetheless, those efforts are significant in scale and strategic terms, and also include a lot of long-term initiatives, commitments and aspirations that, if they are all executed on, may have a significant impact on the balance of conventional military power between NATO and its potential challenges, at least compared to where the situation would have been if Russia hadn't launched its full-scale invasion in February 2022. Finally, it's probably impossible to fully assess any of this in a vacuum. Ukrainian or European NATO efforts don't mean much unless they're contrasted or measured against Russia's ones. And Russia, it must be said, despite having considerably more limited overall financial resources, and even if it has little prospect of challenging the NATO alliance as a whole in terms of defence production, has every incentive to at least try to outpace the aid to Ukraine and Ukraine's own production, in order to try and achieve some sort of positive strategic result there. Because even if the NATO militaries themselves find themselves almost completely overhauled, if the fight in Ukraine is still lost, then that will be a strategic defeat regardless. In conclusion, there are signs of NATO nations seeking to rearm themselves in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Some of those efforts are grand and rapid, like that of Poland. Some are grand, but moving at the pace of peacetime bureaucracy, like that of Germany. And others haven't really made it out of the starting gate. By historical standards, the overall effort is pretty small as a share of GDP. But nonetheless, given the size of the NATO economies, between industrial efforts, increased equipment purchases and security assistance to Ukraine, probably reflects increase in overall rearmament efforts over pre-full-scale invasion levels. What remains to be seen is the pattern that those investments will follow going forward, to what extent new domestic investments will turn into additional surplus equipment supplied to Ukraine, and how NATO's strategic competitors will choose to respond to the fact that the alliance's defence industry and militaries appear to be going through a slow but significant reinvigoration. Okay, channel update to close out. Over the last 18 months or so, there's been a major surge in activity in the global defence sector, particularly in Europe. I've been moving through Scandinavia myself, and the change in atmosphere and activity is pretty obvious. 
That's ultimately what gave me the idea to zoom out for a week and take a look at the big picture around NATO defence expenditure since Russia's full-scale invasion, giving us a solid base to talk about specific industrial indicators like employment or output, as well as to better compare to Russian efforts in the near future. As a data-driven episode, this was arguably a back-to-basic situation for the channel, so I hope very much that you enjoyed the episode and found it useful. Special thanks, as always, to my sound guy for doing his best with whatever I give him, my great appreciation to Scandinavia for its fantastic hospitality, and my warmest thanks to those of you who continue to engage with and support this channel. It is always tremendously appreciated, and it's ultimately for you that, as always, I'll be back next week.